is Audrey Mack with Gotel Ministry. Uh, I'm so glad you joined us once again for this program on divine healing. I have it in my heart to, um, to really teach on divine healing. Why? Because I see that we are in a society, a sick society, where there is medical center, there is hospital on every corner. People are sick. And so even in the body of Christ, you know, I see sometimes there is no difference. The body of Christ is as sick as the world, and that should not be. Because we saw in the sessions b before that Jesus, uh, Father God from Genesis to Revelation, wants his people healed. And we see that he went and paid for it. He went on the Christ, on cross to pay for our sin, pay for our sickness. So now it is no longer a matter of is it the will of God? Because if something is paid for, you know it is the will of God. Uh, so God wants us well. And it's just a matter of us getting a hold of what God has so graciously given and paid for. But that has to be through faith. Faith has to be involved. And if you don't know anything about faith, uh, I invite you to go to a whole series that I did on Victorious Faith. It will give you a good understanding on how to walk by faith and how to receive the blessings of God and healing by faith. It's really not that complicated. So today I want to go a little further. I want to talk about, you know, some of the hindrances that would keep you you know, from getting healed. And what I'm talking about is false teachings, wrong doctrines that have been sowed by the enemy into the body of Christ to keep, you know, people from receiving the healing. You know, Jesus even talked about it when he gave a parable about the wheat and the tear. He said, the enemy will come and sow so, uh, uh, the tears among the field of God uh, and the tears will grow and what it will do, those tears will try to snuff out the wheat, try to hinder the wheat from growing and the people of God from receiving. So um, those false doctrines oftentimes um, have been born really in because our people really, we talked about it, people uh, maybe having prayed for healing or having, you know, seen loved ones die and it is less painful to put it on God and put the responsibility over onto God and say, well, it must have been the will of God or, you know, look at this or look at that. That just to really admit and have enough humility just to say, well, maybe we know God is good, like a good father. And, and, and I'm not going to accuse God of being a child abuser. Uh, no, I'm, maybe it's something here, down here. There is a short circuit somewhere. It's something down here that is hindering us, stopping us, blinding us from really receiving what, you know, God has for us. I mean, even Jesus talked about it. In Mark chapter nine, 7, verse 7 through 13. In verse 13, you know, he was talking to the Pharisees, you know, that even came up with a bunch of tradition through the years that were keeping people in bondage. And Jesus said in verse 13, he said, You have nullified and made the word of God of no effect, of no power, because of your tradition, which you have passed down from generation to generation. So that's what I'm talking about. You see, traditions, false doctrines, things that is keeping the word of God that has power, that is living, that is active, that want to set you free. It is keeping that word to produce fruit, to produce life. Even Jesus in the parable of the sower, he said that there will be, there will be thorns and, and weeds that will come and snuff out your word, which produces faith in your heart. And so this is we're gonna, what we're going to do. We're going to expose some of those. And some of you might have those questions, not in a, in a uh, uh, um, judgmental way, but in an honest, authentic, truthful way. You said, now how about this? How about that? How about this? So we're going to answer some of those questions together. So put your seatbelt on. I hope you are ready. But more importantly, if what you hear goes against what you've been taught, have enough humility and have an open heart. You know, like the people in Berea. He said they had a noble character because when they heard 
Paul teach, even though it challenged them, it contradicted what they had heard, you know, if they had enough nobility and, and, and to go back into the word and study it and read it and said, okay, what is it that Paul said? And you know, God said they were of a noble heart and they studied the scripture to see what Paul said was true. So just keep an open heart and open mind and just ask the Holy Spirit and go into the word and read the scriptures that I'm giving you and look at it and said, okay, is what she's saying, is this, is this true? And ask the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of truth. He will testify of it to you. Amen. And if what I'm sharing is not in the word, then just take it out. Just throw it out. But if what I'm sharing with you is in the word, then hallelujah. Just, just let the word do a work in your heart. Amen. So the first question that we are going to address is, um, does God make people sick? And so oftentimes people use a scripture, of course, in the Old Testament, under the law, in the book of Exodus, Exodus 15, verse 26. It says, God says, I will put none of the diseases upon you that are put on the children of Israel. And I will add, he even said, because I am the Lord who heals you. You know, but let's just talk about that first part. I will put none of the disease that, uh, upon you. Now, there is a man of God. His name is Robert Young. He was a scholar of Greek and Hebrew. I mean, he's the one who wrote the Young Concordance. Um, and he, he, this is what he said. He said, in the, in the Hebrew language, there are grammatical tense that are not found automatically in the English or in the uh, modern languages. And he said, really, that verse, he said, in the Hebrew, there is a tense which is called a causative tense and a permissive tense. A permissive tense, what is it? It's, you know, you by default are allowing somebody else to do something, you know. Um, for example, when Adam was in the garden, because he remained past, because he stayed and didn't do anything, uh, he allowed the devil to do certain things. Amen. And so Robert Young said in that verse, what is actually used is the permissive tense. And what does it mean? He said, this is how you should translate truly that verse. This is how you should read. He says, I will permit upon you none of the diseases which I permitted to be brought upon the Egyptian, for I am the Lord that heals you. I mean, it kind of makes sense. God is the healer. And so he's not the one who makes sick, he's the one who heals. But he had to allow certain things to be put on the children of Egypt. But he said, I will not allow, if you follow my law and listen to me and do what I say, I will not allow what I had to allow to be brought on Egypt. I mean, even we can see that verse being, you, you can even see a, a confirmation of it in the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. This is here what it's talking about. In Exodus 12, 23, it says, when you know God sees the blood, he will pass over the houses of the children of Israel, and he will not allow the destroyer to come and destroy them and bring judgment and bring the plague. That is exactly what it's talking about. And we see here in Exodus 12, 23, a explanation or confirmation of that which you're talking about. And so, um, God had to permit certain things and allow certain things. You know, like he said, I put the law. Remember that from Exodus, you know, from the time God gave the law, amen, God set the law in place. And so God gave the law 
for a reason, which I will talk in a little bit, explain it. But when somebody disobeyed the law or somebody obeyed the law, we saw that there would be a, a blessing for those who obeyed and a punishment for those who disobeyed. In another word, if you allow, here is a picture that I see. God is like God with a big umbrella, you know. Here you are a big umbrella. And here I am, God is holding the umbrella. And he's asking you and calling you to come right with him under that umbrella and it's raining really hard now the one that chooses to walk away from God then it would get wet it would get under the rain you know was that God fault no he, 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 the person who walked away exposed himself to the rain exposed himself to the punishment or the cursing if you allow, it was not God that said, okay, I'm going to let it rain on you. No, it is like that person walked away from that umbrella of protection. And the person who walks away from the umbrella will get wet. The person that walked away from God and his commandment, he says, I put before you life and death. Choose life so you can remain under my umbrella of protection. And the one that walked away would get under the curse or would get wet. Do you understand what I'm trying to see? And so we should not confuse commission and permission because God had to allow certain things to be done under the law. Doesn't mean that he is the author of it. You know, it's like, for example, if you have a mommy, if you have a mommy that tells his kid, Hey, um, don't touch the fire, because if you touch the fire, you'll get, you'll get burned. Do you hear me, little Johnny? Do not touch the fire. But of course, mommy is cooking. She's getting busy doing what she does. Oh, and you know what happened when you tell little Johnny, don't do this? What is the first thing he's going to want to do? And here little Johnny touches the fire, and he gets burned, and he gets really hurt. Now, because he got burned, would you automatically assume that that was the will of the mommy? That she wanted him to be burnt? Was it the will of the, that was she the one who burnt him? Was she the one who, did she have delight in him getting burnt? No, absolutely not. And, be, and, 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 and in another word, you know, he's the one who touched the fire, and by touching the fire, he got burned. But you know, sometimes people will say, you know, but because he got burned and because she told him, don't touch the fire, doesn't mean that she's the one who wanted him to be burned, or he did it, who allowed even it. It's just that he did it and he got burned. And you know, there are people that say, well, no, God allows sickness to teach us a lesson. You know, let me explain something. You know, when that little Johnny gets burned, you know, what will mommy do and say? She will use that opportunity to teach him a lesson. She'll say, little Johnny, didn't mommy told you, tell, told you not to touch the fire? You see, I was right. You got burned. Mommy told you don't touch the fire and you touched it. Do you understand? Do you understand what mommy says? Don't touch it again. You see, she takes that opportunity to teach him something. But does this mean that it is her way of teaching her kid? Does it mean that it is her way of, of, of teaching? That it is her heart, her desire for him to get burned so she can teach him something? That would be ridiculous. I mean, that would be not a very good mommy. That would be a child abuser. And yet, we accuse God to do the same. You know, so many times this is what is happening. You know, God says, don't do that. The Holy Spirit will put, you know, roadblocks, will put red lights, uh, stop signs, you know, flashing lights to say, don't do this, don't do this. And then sometimes we're a little head, you know, strong, and we go ahead and bypass the warning of Holy Spirit, and we do things. And while we're in the middle of a problem, and we get hurt, and we get sick, or whatever... God in his goodness, you know, will minister righteousness to us, but he will teach us, he will say, you see, what this is what I'm talking about. Don't do that. You know, by doing this, this is what, he will use it 
to teach us something, but does it mean that it is his way of teaching us? Does it mean that it was him who allowed it in a very sadistic way so we can learn something? Does it mean that it is his will or even? No, that, is, that would be wrong to assume that a good, good father would allow sickness. I call it like, I said, this is like sadistic. She said, oh, I'm going to allow you to get sick, so I can teach you something. It's like a mother that would say, I'm going to to allow you to get your hand in the fire so I can teach you something. How twisted is this? You know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, God under the law, and oftentimes that's the people, they will use that, you know, from Exodus 20, where the law came in place, all the way to Malachi, and they will take scriptures. But you understand that, you know, God has set the law in place. And if people disobey the law legally, because God has set that law in place, legally God had to let the law do its job. It had to allow, God is a God of justice. And he will not break his law or go against the law. I mean, here is another example. It would be like a father. I mean, he loves his son. He loves his son so much that he tells him, you know what? I see the kind of friend, friends you keep in company. I don't want you to hang out with those friends anymore. They are bad influence. Do you hear me? Don't go with those people. You're gonna, it, it, something bad might happen to you if you hang out along them long enough. But you know the son, like a lot of you know, teenagers, they think they know everything. And the son will go and you know, even despite you know, the father doesn't know, he'll just go and hang out with those, those people. And, and then one night they just kind of start drinking, they get drunk, and then, well, they end up doing something. They, they go and go to a convenience store and attack the person, you know, and, and rob that, that person. But then they get arrested. Now, the father loves the son. The father does not want the son to go to jail. The father would try to do everything he could to try to, you know, see his son go and be in. But you know what? As much as the father loves the son, as much as it is not his will and his desire for the son to end up in a bad place and in prison, the father has to let justice be done. Or oh, that would be unfair and that would be unjust. And so God is a good father. And as much as he loves his children, you see, under the law, he gave the law. And under the law, he had to allow for those who disobey, for those who walked away from under his umbrella of protection. Legally, God had to allow justice to be, to be done, to be served. You know, otherwise he would, he would have been unjust and God is not unjust. And I can imagine that God's heart was broken. You know, I like it even says in Ezekiel 33, and he said it three times. He said, I do not wish it. I have no delight that the wicked perish, but that they come, that they repent. That's the heart of God. You know, he has no delight in, in seeing his children punished under the, the law. But now you might say, why did God bring the law? You know, it's an interesting question. And let me try to answer it in the next uh, few minutes together. Why did God bring the law? It was never his will. Never his intention. You know, when we took, he took the children of Israel out of Egypt, he told them, he said, I want to make a nation of priests out of you. I want to talk to you face to face. I want to have a relationship with you. But you know, the children of Israel, they were slaves. They had come out of a slavery. They, they came out of Egypt, but Egypt had not come out of them. They still had that slave mentality. And when God said, I want to talk to you. I want to have a relationship with every one of you. I want every one of you to be a priest unto me. I want to talk to you. You know what they said? Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to talk to you. We're afraid. Oh, Moses, you go and talk to him. But then you come and tell us. They refused. They did not want to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And so God 
God, you know what he had to do in order to protect them, to bless them, to guide them, to direct them to the promised land, he had to come to the level. And what do I mean by that? He had to treat them like the way they understood, like slaves. They had the slave mentality. All they knew to be motivated. All they knew to be restrained. All it was what they had learned in Egypt as slaves. And what was it? Pew! Punishment. You don't do enough brick. Pa! Lashing. Punishment. That's all they knew. And God, in His mercy, in order to direct them, to protect them, to bless them, to help them, He had to come on the level and treat them like slaves. And what do you do with slaves? You do good, okay, you'll have a, 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 a reward. You do bad, there will be heavy punishment. But you notice, I want you to see something. That is not the way God dealt, you know, from Genesis 1-1 all the way to Exodus when God, 20, when he brought the law. If you look, at it's a period of 2,400 years. God never dealt this way with the people, with Abraham. Ab I mean, was Abraham perfect? No. You see, under the law, in Leviticus 18, and uh, um, I think it's Deuteronomy 22, according to the law, it was an ab abomination to marry his sister or his half-sister. And what did Abraham do? He married his half-sister. You know, under the law, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not lie. And if you do, punishment. What did Abraham do? He lied, not once, twice. Oh, this is not my, my wife, this is my sister. You can have at it. How coward, and how, you know, uh, he lied. But God didn't, didn't punish him. You look, even Cain. You see, when Cain was found and had murdered his brother, do you know God dealt with him with grace and mercy? Because when Cain, who was still in God's presence, you know, and he lied, and he said, oh, oh, am I my brother's keeper? And God says, what did you do? He said, uh-uh, he still had blood on his hand. And he said, oh, I didn't do anything. And when he cried out to God, and God said, because of you, now the, the earth is totally cursed. You know, and anybody that will find you, you know, will destroy you. You know, Cain cried out and said, oh God, no, do something. You know what God did? He put a seal of protection upon his forehead to protect him. God did not punish him. God dealt with him with grace and mercy. And so we see for the first 2,400 years, God dealt with people with grace. And you know, we see that it's only for 1,600 years, the period of Exodus 20 all the way to Malachi, that God had to deal with people with punishment and blessing because they were under the law. And we found out why had God br bring, had to bring the, the law, to deal with them according, uh, like slaves, to get on their level so he could help them and protect them. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? What about the flood? That was during the time, you know, in the first... Well, you know, if you look at it, when God brought the flood and he had to wipe away the whole humankind, let me ask, you know, during that time, there was a man called Methuselah. And it is said he's the man that lived the longest, 969 years. Why? Because though God had spoken to this generation that was so pervert, so wicked, I mean, homosexuality was rampant, bestiality was rampant, it was so wicked, there was no fear of God. The only family that feared God was the family of Noah, eight people, for those all that time when God told to Noah to build an ark. Noah was called a, a, a preacher of righteousness. He preached to those people of this generation. He preached, go, you know, repent, turn away, serve God, feel God. Nobody listened. And during that time when Methuselah was alive, Methuselah, you know, the name Methuselah said, when he dies, it shall come, it shall come. What shall come? That judgment that God spoke about. And but why? And it, it waited. God waited. God waited. God waited. And and Methuselah lived, 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 and would not die. He meant even bypassed his own father. 
He, uh, he bypassed his own son, I mean. But, but why did God do that? Because God's heart was not to destroy. His heart was that people would repent, that people would turn to... But finally, finally, God could wait no longer. Why? Because only when, when Methuselah died, when Noah entered into the ark, how many people entered? Only one family, eight people. Why? And why did God have to bring that judgment? Because if God had not rescued Noah into the ark, the whole earth would be so corrupt that redemption would be impossible. It would be impossible for God to bring a seed out of a woman, a woman that was pure enough, that was a virgin in whom the Son of God could be birthed and would come into the earth. The Son of God could not have come because that generation would have been so corrupt, no one would have feared God. And so God rescued one family. He rescued one family that would fear God that could come and bring forth a generation that could fear God. That's the reason why. But you know something else I found? That's the reason why God had to destroy the earth with a flood to save humankind. You know, it's like if you have a, a, a leg that is turning black, that has gangrene or cancer, to save your life, do you know what the doctor will do? He will cut your leg. It cuts your leg and you say, wow, that's pretty rash. That's pretty mean. No, that's an act of mercy. The doctor will cut your leg to save your life. That's what God did. He brought the flood and destroyed humanity to be able to save humankind. So that one day he would find a virgin. He would find a people that would fear God in whom he could plant that seed of holiness to bring the Son of God. And you know, we see also in the last 2,000 years, which is from the time that Jesus came until today, God does not impute sin. Listen to that verse. It is found in 2 Corinthians 5.19. He said, whereas God, God was in Christ, reconciling the world in himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. In another word, today, in this dispensation of grace, God deals with us with grace. He does not impute sin unto us like he did not impute sin unto Abraham and unto those people that lived and before the law. And we even see, you know, the example, you know, it's amazing because people see God so quickly as a judge when in reality his true nature is a good father. Because you see, when the children, the disciples, they crossed Samaria and, and the people did not accept Jesus. And they said, no, no, we don't want you. We don't want you to spend the night. You know, John and James, the, th the son of thunder, said, oh, Jesus, do you want us to call fire from heaven to burn them like did Elijah, you know, in the Old Testament? Jesus rebuked them. That's found in Luke 9, verse 51. Jesus rebuked and he said, you do not know of what spirit you are made of. You don't know what spirit, why? Because the spirit, God, and you know what Jesus did? They moved down. They let those people, okay, they don't want to receive me. Well, let's move on to the next place. Jesus didn't judge them, though they rejected him. But Jesus showed grace and mercy because we are in a dispensation of grace. Just like the dispensation of Abraham from Genesis 1, 1 to, you know, Exodus 20. The same dispensation of grace. Our covenant is a fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham. And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're made of because the spirit of God is not the spirit of judgment. And you know, he had to punish under the law, but that was not his will, his heart, his, his desire. And Jesus said, no, the spirit of God is love, he is mercy, he is grace, and he is truth. So I hope this is helping you to connect the dot and just see that God is not the one that wants to make people sick. No, he brought the law for a reason. Amen. And, and it, that was not his heart and his intention. So come back to the next uh, session together. We're going to go a little further. Amen. God bless you. Music.